guys. Um, we're going to start today with a very introductory course in Optitex. So, um, I still have the old uh, remote software link. You might have a new one. It might look exactly the same. But we're going to go ahead. I'm going to uh, do the same thing that you guys are going to have to do. And log in uh, to our desktop. And it is going to give me again uh, the desktop to a computer an M119, which will look like this. And from here, we can go ahead and uh, utilize our Optitex. So yours will look something like this. If it doesn't look exactly like this, don't worry. What you're looking for is PDS 17 with a little uh, scissors on the gold circle. And this is what we're going to be using. There's a few other Optitex programs that are run in sort of tangent, marker, blah, blah, blah. A little bit later, we'll talk about those. But for the majority of this course, we're going to be sticking with PDS 17. So let's go ahead and open it up and take a look at what it looks like, its basic functions, how to navigate it around, all the good stuff. So this is what our Optitex looks like when we open it up. So let's take a look at um, basically what each area is about. Now this large uh, black area with the rulers on both sides flanking it is our work area. This is where we're going to build, create, change, manipulate our patterns. Um, over here in our toolbox, if I hit the toolbox uh, tab, um, these are all the tools that we're going to use to do just that. Now it looks like an awful lot and every one of these has a little bit of drop, as a drop down uh, menu to get to the uh, different tools. So they're categorized by what you might need to do and you will look inside them to go ahead and find the correct tool. Now um, it looks like a lot because there's all this stuff up here. Now these are just the tool shortcuts. So everything that's in here in this uh, toolbox on the side is also here. So it's just redundant. It's not really that much stuff. In addition, a lot of this stuff here is also in our main file menus. So um, as we're going to go, let's go ahead and look at our main file menu options uh, up here, or our main uh, sort of menu tab up here. So um, I can go ahead and hit file. Now all of the stuff we normally see in a file menu is there, our new, our saves, our opens, yada yada. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff too that we're not going to use, so uh, I just want to kind of go over it so you know what it is. Um, Optitex has a digitizer option, which a lot of these are uh, relating to. And um, it, what it is, is Optitex has the ability um, to digitize existing physical patterns. Um, uh, it is set up in our lab, however, I'm not quite sure. Uh, how much our physical lab is going to be open or the uh, 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 facilities that will be available to students. Um, but long story short, um, if you have a physical pattern, um, uh, we have a computer that is hooked up with a very special Optitech um, sort of mat and mouse. Uh, with the special mouse, you click the points of your pattern and it creates a... Um, a pattern in Optitex from that pattern. So it's pretty neat. Um, so we have this ability to take actual physical paper or fabric patterns and create a digitized version of them. Now we're not going to be doing too much of that, but I just sort of want to go over it. Now the rest of these, all these down here relate to um, printing out your patterns. Uh, plotter printers are large scale uh, printers ones that can handle large printouts like a full-size pattern um, and these are all about sort of um, uh, sort of tying and meshing and syncing uh, Optitex with that plotter printer and again we're not going to be doing that but you should know what it is uh, etc etc and then you should know you know recent files is recent files um, and exit is exit now, undo, uh, or sorry, your edit menu has all of these stuff. Again, you're used to seeing in an edit menu. Undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, delete, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, we also have select all, um, if you want to select everything on your page, so on and so forth. And again, I'm not going to go into every little detail, we'll just go over the main things. Piece, we're going to be using piece a lot, uh, especially when we want to create a new piece, because of course that's where we do it. Um, it has a lot of standard shapes for us to start with, rectangular pieces, circular pieces, arc pieces, things like that. Um, it also helps us uh, uh, manage uh, different attributes about a piece and things like that. Now, we're not, we won't use a ton of this stuff in here, um, but we will use a, a new piece quite a bit. So that's really what we're looking here in our piece. Now, grading we're not going to be using. I just want to talk a little bit about what grading is. And it's not on the schedule, but if there's a lot of demand for it, I might do a little bit of a lesson for it if you guys really want to see it. Um, but when we talk about grading, um, it means we are uh, taking a pattern and creating the different sizes. So um, in the fashion industry, what we typically do is our original pattern for a garment is drafted in a middle size. So just very basically, um, uh, I might do a medium size, uh, draft that for our original pattern. Then the grading process takes that um, original medium pattern and alters it to create the small, the extra small, and, but also the large and the extra large. Um, so we're not going to go too much into that, but again, if the, you guys really want to see some of that, um, I can, uh, you know, by t popular demand, I want to hear what you guys want to do and what you guys want to learn. So if there's a big demand, uh, you know, let me know, email me. Oh, I really want to do a grading one. I really want to learn how to do that. Let me know and we can do, uh, uh, find a little bit of time to do a, uh, a lesson or two on grading. But basically, it is just creating all the different variations uh, of that, well, not variations, but sizes of a particular pattern. And it's important to note um, that we typically start in the middle because every time we go to another size, the pattern gets slightly skewed, a little bit mutated, a little bit altered. So if we start in the middle, um, there's never too many iterations up or down for it to get really, really skewed. So, for example, if we started at that extra small, by the time we got all the way to the extra large, uh, it'd get a little wonky, the proportions would be a little off, um, so we like to start at the middle, so again, when we go up and down, it's never too far away from that original pattern and those original proportions. Design here um, has a few interesting things. We're going to use segment net length a lot. That's going to help us um, take measurements on angled or curved segments and things like that. We might use a couple other that uh, uh, other things in here, but segment length is really what we're going to be using a lot. And again, when we get to it, I'll show you how that is used. Now, 3D we're not going to use until we get to our 3D uh, system uh, uh, lessons, so we can just sort of forget about that for now. Um, tools, everything here, everything here is also in our tool menu. Um, so again, it's a lot of just uh, repetition for different tools and functions that we see in all these other areas. But the very important thing when it comes to Optitex is down here. Under tools, the very last setting is preferences. Now I'm going to click that and open it up because this again is very, very important and I'm going to probably start every lesson uh, with this or at least the first ones. Now this has remembered my preferences um, because this is the, the teacher's computer and it will remember my preferences. However, the student computers will not remember your preferences. So it is very important for you guys every time you open up to make sure that your units are in inches. Now, because this is an American school, uh, we're going to be doing things in imperial units. That's inches, feet, you know, fractions of inches and so forth. However, the whole rest of the world doesn't use imperial units. They use centimeters, millimeters, so on and so forth. Um, so the default for Optitex 
is to have the units in centimeters. Um, now, as when America switches over to the metric system, I will be the first one cheering it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of imperial units. They're a little bit more wonky to use, but um, uh, a lot of you are American students, so that's what you're used to. Uh, you foreign students, I'm sorry, we still have got to use uh, uh, imperial. All of your um, measurement charts that I'm going to hand out to you are in inches, uh, so I'm going to expect everything to be done in inches. Um, and it is very important for you to go ahead and switch it, so if you want to switch it, just come up here, click the units, and you can, you can choose whatever you want, uh, but we're going to be working in inches. Now, the danger of this is if you go ahead, you open it up, and you forget to do this, what's going to happen is all of the numerical values that I give you for measurements and things like that are in inches. But if this is in centimeters, um, all those numerical values are going to be read as centimeters. So all of your uh, patterns that you create are going to be to small um, because an inch is uh, bigger than a centimeter. It's about 2.5 centimeters, so it's going to be um, uh, a little less than half as big as it should be. So very important. Um, it can be very easy to forget this. Um, it, it, it happens every semester. Someone turns into me a, a sloper or a pattern and the measurements are, are way too small um, and there is no good way to convert um, the pattern once it has been created because it just physically is too small. Um, so always, 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 always remember uh, to go to Tools, Preferences, and just double check that you're working in inches because I'd, I'd hate for uh, you to, uh, you know, do a whole bunch of work in centimeters and then you know, it's not usable. It's, you know, just a waste of time, and I don't want anybody to waste their time. Okay, anywho, moving on. Uh, view is going to be helpful with anything that might disappear, any, any box or window that may disappear. Um, it allows you to sort of uh, 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 pop things up and down. So here's your toolbox. Um, that's right here, toolbox. So if I want to you know, toolbox clicking, it's already there, but if you happen to accidentally click away your toolbox, uh, like I just did there, you can just go to view and click it back up and it will come and pop back up. Same thing with your pieces window, if you um, click it away, or really any sort of uh, different thing that we need, um, you can find it here in your view. And again, as we go, um, more of these things will be necessary. Really, your toolbox, your piece window are what you're going to need um, to start off with. Um, the ruler, of course, should, should typically be up there so you can see it. Um, uh, you can see your seams or not see your seams. Guidelines, of course. Uh, we have guidelines just like in Illustrator or in Photoshop, and I'll show you how those are used in some of our first assignments. Um, but you can control whether you see them, whether you don't see them, so on and so forth. You can even grid things. Um, uh, so anything that you would like to see or are missing, say your toolbox or your piece window or something like that, or something just doesn't look right, you can go to your view and uh, find where it is and get it to pop back up just by clicking on it. Okay. Here's the cloud. We don't have cloud options, so don't worry about this. This is useless and help is um, not very helpful. Uh, uh, you can just go to that website that I showed you in the intro course if you need help on OptiTex um, or email me. Uh, always an option, of course. Okay, so uh, that's our main basic menu. So let's go over some of our functions and some of our tools, okay? So um, the first thing that I want to do is I want to go over the draft tool. Now the draft tool looks and works a lot like our pen tool in either Illustrator and Photoshop if you use the pen tool in, in Photoshop. So we're going to use that 
first and we're gonna use see most of these are shadowed out that's because we don't have anything to work with first as soon as we have an actual pattern piece to work with all these will become usable uh, the ones that are of course we have uh, say you know the ones that are normal um, that you could see uh, new if you want to create a new file uh, open if you want to open a file uh, save if you want to save a file print blah blah these are all normal and of course it's very helpful you can just hover your mouse over a tool if you don't know what it is and it's gonna let you know what that tool is for now here we are we have draft let's start here as um, our draft tool will allow us to create um, a pattern piece and um, you can see it's telling me that this is our draft tool and it has that D right next to it. Now the D is letting us know that that is the keyboard shortcut for the tool. So what I can do for draft is I can click on the draft tool or I can simply hit D on the keyboard and the draft tool will pop up. That's the nice thing about uh, keyboard shortcuts. And, and here it shows all of our keyboard shortcuts and the typical ones that you guys are used to, control C, control V, uh, they're the same as any other program. So those are all the same. Um, and of course, like I said, our tools are found up here in the sort of shortcut um, icon bar, uh, but also here in this one. So our draft tool is, I think, my favorite tools it's right here so we can find it here and we can find it here so again just redundancy because you know whenever I open up a new program and there's a hundred million icons and menus it's a little intimidating but a lot of this stuff is just redundant it's not quite as much as we see and again um, just like something like Photoshop we're going to be utilizing you know a few key tools again and again and a lot of this stuff is 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 pretty a obscure stuff that we're not really going to be using that much so um, you know with just a few tools and a few functions you'll be well on your way uh, to you know uh, uh, basic drafting capabilities and we'll slowly add those other tools and other capabilities as we go okay so let's take a good look at the draft tool so um, you can tell uh, whatever tool you're using um, because the icon for it will change uh, when you move to the work window. And this little thing that looks, I think it looks kind of like a, an X-Acto knife more than a, uh, a pen, but eh, it's a draft tool. So what we're going to do is just like Illustrator, we're going to create lines that will form our pattern pieces. And those lines are kind of like connect the dots. We lay down a point, and then we lay down a subsequent point and a line will be joined in between them. So just to show you, I'm going to click once and there is my first point. Now a little temporary green line is going to be stretched out to give you a little preview of what the line will look like when I uh, click again. So let me click again boop, and there we go. And I'm going to just um, drag out, click drag out, click, drag out, click, wherever I want my points to be. Now since we're just sort of messing around, and again, um, this would be really good for you guys to do, just log on, make sure that you can get to Optitex, play around with your draft tool, get a feeling for it, um, so you know how it works and everything else. You know, the best way to learn anything is just to sort of mess around with it, um, so be sure to do that. Uh, in addition to watching this lesson, have you know, plan your and again, it's it's important just so you know that you're able to connect and that everything is functioning properly. Now, I'm not going to get a full piece until I close or meet my beginning. So, because this is not a program just to simply draw or create lines, it's a program to create pattern pieces. So pattern pieces need to be fully enclosed shapes. They can't just be lines. Imagine just having a random line and trying to cut it out of fabric. It's not possible. We need those full enclosed two-dimensional shapes. So what we do is we always have to finish any piece 
where it begins. Now I'm doing that by clicking on my original point. You can also do that by double clicking wherever you are. Now it's going to ask me, am I done digitizing? And if I am, looks like I am, I have that nice full enclosed shape, I'm going to say yes. Now, now that I have yes, you can see that the shape has changed. It is now a pattern piece. It has uh, points that are all numbered in the order that I laid them down. And it also has two very important pieces, uh, bits of information that are present on all pattern pieces. We have a piece name, and until we give it another name, it's simply draft, because Optitex can't read our minds. We don't know what it's supposed to be. Um, and since it's just a sort of random shape at this point, it's, you know, that's what it is. Um, and it also has this arrow. Now, uh, most of you, hopefully, will recognize this as a grain line. Uh, the grain line is an essential bit of information that should appear on every pattern piece created. And it's uh, kind of hard to forget in OptiText because for every piece created, it will automatically add one for you. Um, and again, the grain line shows you the direction of the length grain of the fabric. And uh, we should know what that is now, but again, the length grain um, uh, is showing those long uh, warp threads in our woven fabric, but even knit fabrics have a length grain as well. Um, and it is very important to always have it marked on our pattern pieces uh, because all of our pattern pieces must be cut out to have the grain line properly uh, uh, running through each piece. If it is not, uh, the darts won't come together properly. Pleats are just impossible. Shirring is, is uh, annoying as heck. Things will not drape nicely. It will not fall. It can hang askew. All sorts of problems uh, can arise from cutting pattern pieces out on the wrong grain. So having our grain line there is very important. And at least you won't forget it because, of course, Optitex will put it there automatically. Okay, so let's look at a few other aspects of this piece and general ways that we can change and manipulate our piece. So we have our points here. And I want to talk a little bit about points right now. Um, points are, of course, how we create our pattern pieces as... Um, our pattern pieces are simply lines in between our points. Um, we're going to talk a lot about points and um, we're going to go a little bit into how to do our measurements, but let's keep it simple for right now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my arrow tool. So now that we have a piece, you see all of our tools are um, available for us to use on this pattern piece. But in addition to our draft tool, probably the most utilized tool that you're going to be using is this arrow tool. Now the arrow tool is just a selection tool, um, but it allows us to work on specific areas of our pattern piece um, and allow for different things to pop up uh, properties and so on and so forth. It does not work like the arrow tools in Illustrator. You cannot change, move, rotate, or anything else like that with your arrow tool in OptiText. It's just for selecting different parts of your pattern uh, and then being able to work on just those. So, for example, if I click on the pattern piece, the pattern piece is selected. I know it's selected because we have this nice little bounding box. Now we can actually scale our pattern pieces um, just using the arrow tool, but I don't recommend it. Um, you know, just by sort of looking at the bigness and smallness of the piece is not enough. We really have to do things a little bit better, a little bit more numerical. Now, not only can we select pieces, we can move pieces along by clicking and dragging a piece. So um, you see that little hand, I use my arrow tool, I click and hold the mouse button down, and while that mouse button is held down, 
I can drag the piece to other parts of the screen. I can also select individual points. So now I see this individual point is highlighted and we can see that because it gets that nice little box around it. And we can go and we can adjust each point. Okay? So um, how do we change different parts of the pattern? Say I do want to move a point. Well, we have specific tools for that. And Optitex really likes to specialize its tools, so unlike in Illustrator where one tool can do a variety of different manipulations, Optitex is, you know, one tool is going to do one thing. So if we move to movement, um, again, look at what you want to do, and then within that section you're going to find the tool uh, that is relevant uh, to what you would like to do. So. Our first tool here is move point. If I want to move a point, I'm going to use the move point tool. So again, the tools have uh, are not hidden riddles. Uh, they are very you know obvious and sort of self-explanatory, which is nice for us uh, as beginners to um, understand what everything does. So I'm going to grab that move point tool, and again, keyboard shortcut M, and we can also look up here to see the similar icon and uh, we can see that um, we have the same tool right here right next to our um, draft tool so we can click here we can click here or we can simply hit uh, M on our keyboard and utilize the keyboard shortcuts to pull up our move point tool now this is what the move point tool looks like it looks like a little arc with a dot and an arrow what we do is we align that little dot on the arc with the point we want to move click once it will pick it up you don't need to click and hold just click once to pick it up and I can move the mouse around and we see that I can change the shape of the pattern piece by moving that point where it um, wherever it is I want to move that point to if that's where I want to move it to I click again and it will drop that point down, changing the piece. So I'll just show you again. Click once to pick it up, move it to where you want it, either by expanding or subtracting the piece shape, and click again to drop it back down. Now, let's say I don't want to move it out. I just want to move a point kind of along a line. We're going to use this one instead. Um, and we're going to use this one less. So I can't change the shape. So see, I clicked once to pick up point number three, but I can't change the shape of the object. I can only change the location of that point three. So um, again, a lot of times there's confusion between what's the difference between the move point and the move point along contour. Uh, we're gonna use move point more than we're gonna use move point along contour, but I just wanna show you the difference between the two. Okay. Now let's take a look at um, another tool. So another tool that we use a lot is the scissors tool. So um, as you have learned in probably FD21, cutting patterns is very important. And if you've already taken FD20, you, you know how important uh, scissors are and, and the ability to cut a pattern is. And um, uh, either you have already taken or you're in it now, so um, you'll be learning it regardless anyhow so what's important to remember with OptiTex is it gets a little tricky so this tool here oh I want to cut here's some scissors oh it's the cut tool that's what I want to do on a cut cut is control X so remember if you're in you know word or something and you highlight something and you cut it or you hit control X it cuts the entire selection and puts it on a clipboard. So if I hit that and you, oh no, where's my piece? Oh my goodness, that's not what I wanted to do. It's because you cut the piece and it's now on the clipboard. It's not gone, so don't freak out too much. All you gotta do is paste it back. This of course is paste or control V um, is perfectly acceptable. Copy, um, again, all the keyboard controls uh, or shortcut commands are the same as you're used to seeing. Um, you can paste it back, uh, uh, but just remember 
that this is not, um, you know, like virtual scissors. It's going to cut your entire selection and put it on the clipboard. Um, the tool that you want to use is over here, and it is the cut piece tool or keyboard sh uh, shortcut C. And we can find it down here in our toolbox, uh, of course, as well um, in the cut piece tool right here. So again, this and this are the same. So this tool works exactly like our draft tool uh, where we lay down um, anchor points and a line gets drawn out in between them. Um, if I'm going to use this cut piece tool, I must start on the contour or outlining edge. I cannot start inside the pattern piece. I must begin and finish on the outside edge or the contour line, uh, call it what you will. So let's say I want to just sort of cut this in half. Now I don't need to start on a point. I can start anywhere on the contour line. See? But it will create a point, but that's fine for our purposes. And then just like our draft tool, I can uh, click every time I want a point um, and a line will be drawn in between them and let's end here on point number eight. Now again, I'm beginning and ending along that contour line, and once I reach the edge uh, um, from cutting in the middle, this dialog box is going to pop up. Now it is assuming that every time I cut, I'm going to want to seam these back together. So that's why this menu is popping up. It's asking me what I want to do with seam allowance. But that's not necessarily true. A lot of times we don't want to seam it back together. And that's a little bit more advanced for what we're doing right now. We're going to talk about adding seam allowance later. So I, you can either just cancel or if it's at zero, this, it's zero is no seam allowance, obviously. So you can just hit OK or cancel. It doesn't matter. So we'll just hit OK. Now we have two pieces. And we can tell because now I have two different um, uh, grain lines and if I use my arrow tool I can click and drag them apart to separate okay so that is how uh, are we uh, can draft using our draft tool and also a uh, cut um, so those are uh, two very basic very commonly used tools now you say well that's well and good but what if I want to do a curved line all right, so let's go over curved shapes. I'm just going to delete away these, these pieces. You can see that um, here is a little bit uh, better explanation of what our piece window is. It will have every piece that you create. And even if you delete it, it's going to save it in our piece window just in case you want to get it back. So that's quite helpful. Now when you save or exit a program, uh, a lot of times it's going to ask you if you want to save all the pieces in your piece window, which might include a variety of different pieces that you've cut away and deleted. And that's going to be up to you whether you want to save them or not save them. So let's go back to our draft tool and let's take a look at how we can create curved lines. Now it's fairly easy in OptiText. Um, you know, it's, it's not the same as Illustrator where you kind of have to click and drag out to create a curved line. All you have to do in, Illi or I'm sorry, in OptiText is hold the shift key down as you're drawing your line. So I'm going to do that. I'm holding the shift key down and I'm going to make a point. Now it's not curving yet because it, it can't curve unless it has a second point. So don't be, um, uh, uh, dissuaded if you don't immediately get that curved line because as soon as I put down that second point by clicking you'll see that it will begin to curve through that second point line. Now I'm going to keep my uh, finger holding the shift key down and continue with my nice curved piece and we can make any you know number of little shapes and it's just going to curve around. Now, again, remember, if it's not exactly what you want, don't worry, because you can always go back and use your move point tool um, to change it around. So again, I'm just going to use that Q 
keyboard shortcut just by hitting M. And again, if it's not exactly what I want, I can go ahead and change it um, to, to, you know, be what I want it to be. Okay? In addition, if you forget to hold the shift key down or hold it down when you should have released it for a sharp corner, you can always change a point from being a curved point or a sharp point. Now I'm going to go into points a little bit more in detail now because it's very important to understand our points. Uh, of course, because all of our patterns are created by this sort of arrangement of points. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna click back on my arrow tool and let's click on a point. Let's click on this point and let's take a look at the differences. So the points here look different than that original piece. And actually, let, let me create a non-curved piece just real quick, just so we can compare the two. And we can look at the differences between them. So here's just a basic piece, no curve. Um, and visually, we can start to see some differences between the uh, two types of points. So here, these points are small. They're much smaller than these other points. And they're not numbered. We only have one numbered point. Again, we have to have at least one. Um, and this is going to demonstrate the differences between the types of points that we have, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my arrow tool and let's look at a point. I'm gonna look at this point. I'm going to click on it to highlight it. And then once it's highlighted, I'm going to right click so again, I'm going to right click with my mouse on that point, and whenever we right click, we get this nice little drop down menu. And I'm going to go to attributes, and it's going to pop up the internal properties. Now it was already there, so I could have just toggled to that, but in case it's not there, it's important for you to know how to get to this internal properties. Now a lot of different aspects of a pattern piece are going to have properties and we'll get into that later, but this is one is just for this point. And I know that because it's highlighted. I know it's highlighted because it has that little circle around it. Now it's telling me right now that this point is curved, okay? And it is not a grading point. Now these are the two properties that a point in OptiText can have. And they can have both of these points um, or one or the other. It has to have some sort of property. It can't have none of these properties. Um, or I guess it, it can have none of the properties. <laughs> well, if it's not curved, it has a pointed property. So I guess it's, it's that. Um, anywho, so say I didn't want this to be curved anymore, I can toggle that on and off. Or I can go over here and say, oh, I really wanted that to be curved, but I just forgot to hit shift. I can just toggle it on and off again. Now, the grading points are something different. Automatically, OptiText will make any curved point non-grading, and it makes any sharp corner point grading. But again, it doesn't need to be that way. I can make this one non-grading or grading and still maintain its sharpness. So what does grading mean? Grading means that it is a main point of the pattern and that I can take measurements from that point. This is very important because uh, measurements, of course, are going to be one of the largest things that we deal with, whether it comes uh, or whether it relates to making sloper or even manipulations. Um, we're gonna be placing and taking lots of measurements. So grading points, and I'm gonna circle back with this when we sort of uh, move on to our measurement boxes, which will actually be sort of subsequent to this. But a grading point, one that is larger, and if I highlight it, I get a box instead of a circle. And if it has a number, it is a grading point. That means I can take measurements from that point. It, if, if, it is, if it is not grading, it is not going to register in our rulers or in our measurement boxes. So if I want to take measurements from this point, this point right here, I need to make sure 
that it is a grading point. Okay, now it is a grading point and say I want a point two inches uh, from this point, I can do that. I can take measurements from that point. I can place another point two inches or however much many inches away from that point. But I cannot do that if it is not a grading point. Okay? Um, so now that we're on the subject of measurements, let's take a look at our measurement boxes. Now I'm going to draft a new piece and I'm going to do it a less willy-nilly than I did before, just sort of placing points down wherever, which is not really realistic for what we're going to be doing. I'm going to do something very specific. I'm going to do a box, and it's going to be, oh, let's say a 10-inch by 5-inch box. Okay. So first point doesn't really matter where we place it. I can place it anywhere. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw out, let's say I want the short end, the 5 inch end to be this, I'm going to hold down the Alt key. Now a lot of you guys um, uh, will get the measurement boxes to pop up automatically, but you'll have the ability to toggle them on and off, but if you need your measurement boxes to pop up, hold the Alt key down before you click. Now I'm just going to, I'm going to do this particularly skewed. Um, for a reason. So I can show you um, how specific we can be within the measurement box without having to be very careful with where we actually physically sort of draw it here. So I'm going to click here. Now again, I'm making a rectangle, okay? So what I want is I really want this piece to come out perfectly flat and straight and be five inches. Now let's take a look at this measurement box and I want, to, I want to really spend a lot of time here because understanding these measurement boxes are so important to what we do. Um, again, um, really we, this whole uh, subject of pattern drafting revolves around measurements um, and you know creating shapes and creating accurate shapes. Um, so our measurements are really, really, really important. So let's just take a look. This is our measurement box here, okay? Now we have a few options. Now uh, this is where it is taking the measurements from. Now it is taking measurements from the last point. What does that mean? Well, this was the last point that I made. It was the first point that I made, but it was the last point subsequent or previous to creating this point right here. So if I want to take measurements from this point, my origin point here, it should be last point. Now we have other options, as you can see, we have this one as well. From zero, zero means to take measurements basically just on the rulers. Um, you probably aren't going to use that as much, you may, but for the most part you're going to use from last point, especially for creating new pieces like this. So we're going to keep it on from last point. Now these measurements are showing me what measurements this line has that I just drew. And um, these little arrows are showing me where the measurements are being taken from. So we see here, these are the horizontal values. So from here to basically here, just straight and flat, is about 14.6 inches, okay? Now it's also showing me that this line has gone up from the origin point, so up. Here, let me, I'm gonna drag down some, well, I guess I can't do it while this box is open, but for the next one I will, so I can show you precisely. Uh, it's showing me that I've kicked this upward about 2.59 inches. So this point is 2.59 inches higher than this point. This, the diagonal line, is showing me the total distance of this line segment, so 14.87 inches. And it has a angle of about 10 degrees. So if there's, there is an imaginary flat line here, horizontal line, this is about 10 degrees above that, kind of going up. And that's not what I want, right? 
I want something that is perfectly flat and five inches long. So what I'm gonna do is here I'm gonna type in five inches and you can see these are gonna start to learn. I don't want it to go up at all because I want this to be a perfectly flat straight line. So I'm gonna change this down to zero, okay? Total distance of the line is five, perfect. All that distance is horizontal, perfect. It doesn't kick up at all, which gives it a uh, uh, angle of zero. That's what I want. So I'm gonna hit okay, all right? Now let's finish our box. I'm gonna go up. Remember, this is gonna be a five by 10. I'm gonna hold down my Alt key and click. Now I get, again, another uh, uh, measurement box. Now, we're measuring from contour angle, which is sort of, it's gonna measure this sort of angle here, but again, I can now have a few different options, but I wanna measure from my last point created, which of course is this, as we continue to go around. I also have the option, like before, to measure on the ruler. I also have the option to measure from my origin point, which is now this point. Contour angle is really um, uh, uh, the angle that I'm creating right here, which I can do um, uh, very easily, uh, uh, but just to keep it consistent, let's make let's let's do from last point. Now again, we're going up. So all of my measurement I want here. I don't want any difference in my horizontal axis. I don't want it to go um, right or left. I just want it to go straight up. So I did a pretty good job but not perfect, so let's change that to zero. Now I didn't quite get the 10 inches I want, so let's put in that 10 inches right there. And if I did everything correct, as we know, perfect uh, rectangles or squares have 90 degree angles. So it's telling me that this angle is a nice 90 degrees. Well, that's exactly what I want. So I can hit okay. Now let's finish up this square or I'm sorry, rectangle. And again, I'll do this kind of way off to show you. Now, in this instance, I am not moving from left to right like this. I'm moving from right to left. Now, um, this makes a difference because any X value that goes from left to right is positive. Any value that goes from right to left, like this, is negative. So what I have to do, I want this to be five inches, but I don't want it to be five inches over here. I want it to be five inches over here. So I need to put in negative five. And I'm just gonna put in five, so the X is gonna show you sort of where it's put. So I don't want it over here. So let's remember that, and I'm gonna put in negative five, okay? Same thing with our Y value, but we'll get to that in our next step. Now, I don't want any change or, or fluctuation here. Again, I want this to go perfectly horizontally across, so no change up or down. So let's hit the zero there. Now this is a flat angle, so it's gonna show us 180, which is a perfectly flat angle. So this is looking good, so let's continue on. Now I can go ahead and um, Close it to finish digitizing, uh, which isn't going to just, uh, I guess, uh, uh, that's not going to give me the opportunity to show you um, the same principle with the positive negative values in the y axis or vertical axis. If I'm going from bottom to top, it's a po positive value. If I'm going from top to bottom, I'm going to put in a negative value. So um, even though I didn't need to because I'm just matching up with a point that already exists. Um, if I were to type in this value, I would need to do negative 10 as it's going in this direction uh, instead of in this direction upwards. It's going downwards instead of upwards, okay? So there's my five by 10. I can hit okay. And there is my uh, lovely uh, uh, rectangle, okay? So what I'm gonna do, um, I just wanna go again and uh, do a little bit more with the measurement boxes and illustrate my point of 
the um, grading versus non-grading points. Now it's very easy to visualize the difference between a curved and non-curved points. So that's obviously, it's very intuitive. But it's a little bit harder to grasp the concept uh, between a grading and non-grading point. Now, just looking at these points, we know they're all grading. They're all numbered, they're all large, and when I click them, they have a square around them instead of a circle. Again, here in my internal properties, if I, I can also check, uh, uh, the grading property is toggled on, so yeah, they are all grading and non-curved points. And again, I can toggle them on and off at any point, so there's a non-grading, grading, curved, non-curved. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you'll forget to either hold shift down or lift that shift key up and make an accident um, and accidentally uh, curve or not curve a point. Um, and, and really, a lot of times students want to just start all over again, but it's really not necessary because it's very easy to go back and just toggle it on and off. It's a lot quicker than having to draft the whole thing over again. So just remember that. Um, and again, that's one of the advantages of uh, using a digital program instead of, uh, you know, doing it by hand. Do by hand, you know, these mistakes are a pain in the butt to have to fix. But usually mistakes in a digital uh, field like this are very, very easy to fix. We, you know, it's very forgiving. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a new tool and also expand on that measurement box concept a little bit. And we're going to take a look at a new tool called Add Point on Contour, or Keyboard Shortcut O. Or if we look in our toolbox, it is under our points and notches, Add Point on Contour. And, um, you know, again, no riddles or mysteries within the piece name. We're going to add a piece, uh, or I'm sorry, add a point on our outside line wherever we please. Now, I would like the placement of this point to be specific. So I have a, a, a specific measurement in mind. So just like the draft tool, I am going to hold the Alt key down while I click along the contour to place my point. And because I uh, did that, uh, held the Alt key down, it's going to force my uh, measurement box up. Now this measurement box looks a little bit different than the draft one. Um, and it's specific again to placing points. So we look at, uh, we have a few di different values. So up here, we can decide what type of point that we're going to create. Is it going to be created? Is it going to be curved? And we can decide uh, what we want here by toggling these on and off. So let's say I do want a graded point and it's just going to be a point along the contour, so no need to have it curved because it's a straight line. I don't want to change that. Maybe I'm using it to uh, mark where I'm going to make a slash or where I'm going to make a dart or something like that. So I'm just going to do graded point and not curve it. Now let's pop down here and take a look at this box right here. Now this is where the real meat of the subject and the placement is going to be. Now. Um, one important thing to remember about OptiText is it works in a clockwise fashion. So everything kind of goes in a flow like this. Now why is that important? Well, here you can see we have two points um, or two labels called Previous and Next. And you might say, well, what's the previous one? What's the next one? I don't know. Um, well, you can easily tell that by flowing in this direction. If this is the point in question, which it is, because it has a big X through it, um, and we travel around the figure in a clockwise fashion, like so, I hit this point previous to the point in question, and this one next, okay? So this is my previous point, and this is my next. 
Now this is uh, reflected in the point values uh, that the piece is given. So if you remember, I built out the piece in this direction, which was counterclockwise. And Optitex doesn't like counterclockwise. So it did not number the points as such. It's numbering them going in a clockwise fashion. So the points don't get labeled based on when they were made. Otherwise, it would be one, two, three, four, because that's the order that I created them. No, no, no. They get labeled clockwise from the initial point. Okay? So that can also help you if, you know, clockwise is a little bit difficult. You can always sort of look at your points. The previous one will have a lower value. The next point will have a higher, the next highest value, okay? Now these are the points in questions because they're both grading. So remember how I said you can take measurements from grading points, okay? This is a grading point. This is a grading point. So they are my previous and next point. Now I'm gonna show you the alternative later, but let's focus on these values right now. So we have two values and two ways of taking measurements regarding where this point is placed in between two and three, or in between those two points. The absolute value gives you an, a, a, a hard measurement. So I clicked it down here and it's telling me that from my previous point, or from point two, it is three inches away, or three point zero three inches. So this distance here is roughly three inches. Okay? My next point, this is roughly two inches or 1.97 inches. Okay? So those are solid measurements. This is actually three solid inches. This is two solid inches away. So if you have a hard value, you need something to be five inches away, 1.5 inches away, quarter inch away, you want to use an absolute value, okay? Now our next kind of measurement is a proportionate value. And these are always going to be decimals. Um, so because a proportion is like a percentage. Um, and written out when it's not a percentage, a percentage is always a decimal because it's between one and zero or zero and one. Now it's telling me that this is point sixty oh you know point six oh six. That basically means that the distance from two to the point in question is roughly sixty percent of the total distance. Okay? And that leaves roughly 40% of the total distance from here to the remaining point, from here to the next point. So again, this is about 60%. So from previous two point in question is 60% of the total distance between two and three, and 40% roughly between point in question and three, 40% of the total distance between two and three. Now, why is that helpful? Well, say that I want it to be perfectly in the middle of this segment. Well, middle is half, right? Middle is 50%. So let's go ahead and type in 0.5 and see what happens. Well, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and we can see here that these values should be equal. And of course, they would be if I put it in the exact middle of the line. Now, a lot of things are done proportionately because our bodies are proportionate. Um, so if I want it to be specifically a quarter of the distance or specifically a third of the distance, I can type in what proportion I'd like. So if I'd like it uh, specifically a quarter of the distance, of course, that's 25%. Ooh, got one too many decimal points. And we go ahead and that gives me one quarter of the distance. And again, if I want to divide this up into four equal segments, this would be very useful, um, so on and so forth. Now again, we also have our hard numbers. So say I don't want a proportionate value, say I want a hard number. Say I want this to be two inches from this point. Well, then I just go ahead and type in two. So we have all these different options, whether they be 
hard values or proportionate values, which depending on what you're doing, um, you'll utilize one or the other. Um, whenever you have the value that you want and the point placement that you want, you hit OK and your point is there. Okay? Now I'm just going to undo that by Control Z, which is you know uh, our common undo shortcut. And I want to just illustrate the difference between grading and non-grading by um, selecting this point. And again, I can right click, go to attributes, but since my internal properties are already popped up, I can just select it and go here. And I'm going to toggle its grading properties off. So okay, now it's small, it no longer has a number. And I'm going to show you how that affects um, its measurement properties. So I'm going to do the same thing as I did before. And now you can see the numbers are already very, very different. Because now, instead of taking measurements between this point and this point, this point no longer counts when taking measurements. So it's going all the way to the um, previous point that does count, which is this one. So where I clicked it, it's telling me that this all together going boop, 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 all the way up here and then continuing all the way here is 12.39 inches. So it's including this side in the measurements. Um, the next point is still pretty familiar, pretty similar to what we had because again, this is still a grading point. And you can see the proportionate values are very different. Now here, it's telling me that where I've put it is, you know, 83% or roughly 83% between the entire distance between 1 and 2. So if things are looking weird, really make sure that um, you have everything that is grading that should be grading and everything that is not grading that shouldn't be grading. Because, you know, um, obviously if I wanted a specific distance between just these points, this needs to be grading. But sometimes you have grading points um, in the way of other points that you're trying to measure from. In those instances, you have to toggle off the grading or else you're not going to be able. If I wanted to measure from here, I can't. I need to toggle this off. So it all depends on the instance. And um, again, I'm really just showing this to illustrate the difference between a grading point and a non-grading point because again, it's not as visually um, uh, obvious as the, you know, the curve and the non-curve. Okay. So again, maybe I need this to be a specific distance from this point along the contour. Okay, um, maybe it's I need it to be 13 inches. So let's just go ahead and oh, I hope it didn't freeze. Oh, hmm. Okay. Well, Optitech seems to have frozen on me. Um, which is actually just fine because I was going to conclude this lesson right there. Um, this does happen. Optitex is a little bit um, temperamental. Um, and so this is a really great opportunity to let you know. Oh, it might be my internet too. My internet might have cra crapped out. Um, so I don't know. But in any case, always save. Um, Optitex can crap out and crash. Your internet can crash. There are lots and lots and lots of um, uh, ways for you to lose your work. So it's always really important for you to save as you go. So as soon as you start an assignment, you know, if you're just messing around, it doesn't really matter. You know, it doesn't really matter that I lose this because it's just a, um, uh, you know, a demo. Um, but, you know, if this were to happen, oh, yep, see, just totally crashed. Um, Everything crashed. Oh, because I lost my internet. Um, that was my for my computer's fault. I don't know if you guys have spotty connection. If you have spotty connection like me, even all the more, uh, because you can you know work for an hour or two and have all that work done um, and have it all lost, which would really, really, really suck. So always remember, getting that habit is just a good habit to have uh, to save regularly as soon as you open a file and start an assignment save it, save it to your thumb drive. Um, uh, and then as you're working, uh, you know, the shortcut for save is control S. It takes a fraction of a second to hit it. 
Um, uh, so it's always a good habit to have and it can save you hours of work potentially. Um, uh, so I guess a good warning call, but you know, at least for me, I was about to wrap up my lesson uh, there with the difference of the points anyhow. Um, we'll come back next uh, lesson and sort of go over some of the other uh, basics of OptiText, uh, but I don't want to get too into it. A lot of uh, you know, stuff we're going to sort of learn on the way and, and learn and practice as we do our first assignments. So we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to sign off and uh, I'll see you guys in our next lesson, which will be a OptiText intro part two. Um, uh, and be safe, be well, and always save your work. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, see you later. Bye-bye.